All right, so this is the new Torment game. I have not played it at all. This is the first time I've actually ever looked at it. I mean, I've seen videos and I've watched some of the, the uh, developer videos and whatnot. But generally, when it comes to games, I don't like to you know, do, dig too much into them before I play them because it kind of ruins the whole experience for me. So this is my first time actually playing it. This game, I don't even remember when the original came out, Planescape, but I played it maybe a decade ago. Uh, it was right around the same time Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale and all those games came out. And I remember loving it. I remember loving that game. It was, it was unique, it was different, and it had this kind of nice mix of science fiction and fantasy. And uh, this game I just kind of bought really sight unseen. I played Pillars of Eternity, really liked that game, and I knew this had some similarities to that. so. I figured I'd pick it up. So I'm going to go ahead and start and I'm going to go and uh, read as, as uh, I start playing along here. second. Insistent and invisible hands slap and tear at the membrane that protects you. Your first emotion is an involuntary and formless panic. You feel you have forgotten something, something important, as if it once meant the world to you, but the details slip away as you grasp at them. So far, the voice acting Force sounds pretty good. Open. A white-pink, fleshy cocoon surrounds you. Even as you look, a minor rent in its side tears open, and the howling wind forces its way inside. The cocoon rips away, gone before you can grab it, spinning you into a dizzying tumble. You are falling, the world many kilometers beneath you. You catch a glimpse of a curved horizon, and also the ground beneath you that is approaching deceptively quickly. Above you, a small moon is slowly collapsing in upon itself. A corona of acid green and black energy playing around its edges. The wind buffets you and burns your eyes, but you don't need to see the details of the faraway ground to know you're in serious trouble. You won't survive a fall from this stratospheric height. A part of your frantic mind babbles that technically you probably fell from a thermospheric height. You struggle to stay focused as the ground rushes toward you. Instinctively, you spread your arms and legs, and they respond sluggishly. You stop tumbling head over heels. Though you are still spinning laterally, that motion has calmed as well, and you have space to assess your situation, and perhaps to understand the predicament and the body in which you find yourself. Below you, you see a large landmass. A massive ocean dominates the rest of the visible globe, dotted here and there with island chains. Small moons, unusual structures, and strange machines rush past you in glittering profusion as you plummet toward the ground. So I did hear that this game was heavily into the story. I can tell just by this intro that they're setting up the, uh, trying to paint a very vivid picture of what it is that's happening around you. From what you can see of your outstretched figure, you're wearing a black body-hugging suit of some sort. Your skin is light brown, and you seem to have five fingers on each hand. A good set of muscles helps control your fall. Not bulky, but well-toned. But you can't examine yourself too closely without losing the little stability you've gained in the fall. You pull your hands in for a closer look as the air once again takes hold of you. Your hands are soft but scarred. They were not used for manual labor, but they've clearly seen some hard use. You have fresh wounds, as if from acid. And when you run your hands over your hair, you hiss in pain as you find a burnt and bubbled portion of your scalp. The ground is getting closer at an alarming rate. You close your eyes and remember walking through a hall of breathing greenery, a feeling of fear and exhilaration. And you are jolted from your recollection. An enormous pain crashes through your body, a sound of an energy cycle suddenly thrown out of tune and spiraling rapidly upward, and then darkness. Okay. Okay. I had a wave 
waves roll over the floor below, sending vibrations what, through the soles of your boots. So, looks like we can scroll, zoom in and zoom out pretty easily. It's like this is the only thing we can do is touch this thing. Jumbled thoughts cloud your head as you study the empty bowl before you. Drops of liquid fall from the ceiling, spattering on the ground next to the bowl. The light from every drop is reflected into the bowl's rounded hollow, as if it hungers for that light and needs to be filled. Yet the bowl remains dry. Another drop falls from the ceiling and splashes across the pylons, wasted. Gee, let's see. Should we use some might to carefully move the bowl beneath the liquid? Sure. I'm going to go ahead and keep the tutorials running just so we can see um, because this game, the mechanics of the game and the interactions of the game uh, are, are very different to other single player uh, RPGs. Um, you encounter your first task. You have three stat pools, might, speed, and intellect. You can spend to, uh, that you can spend on to increase your chances of success. This is called using effort. Okay. Click on the bowl. Okay, I can see the percent chance over here. If I use one, two, three. Let's do three. Oh, jeez. I failed that. <laughs> it looks like I took some damage in the process. Blood trails from your fingers into the hungry depths of the bowl. Drop by drop it fills, your blood mixing with the light until the air itself takes on a strange reddish hue. Ripple spread over the blurred outline of your reflection. Okay, cool. A sanguine radiance spills across the segment floor, washing away the nearest shadows and pouring into your mind, melting the ragged edges of your fragmented thoughts. You are not whole, not yet, but you have begun to heal from the damage done from your long fall. A voice calls out from somewhere high above, beyond the reaches of the spreading light. Hello, are you still alive down there? We're up here. Build a path, something, build a path up to us. Looks like we need to move over here. Zoom in a little bit. Touch this, take an idea. As soon as you touch the orb, a memory floods your mind. You stand in front of a rusted door. The air is humid and dank. You've had a moment's respite from the waterlogged hell. A bubble of stale air in your resting point. You've breathed water before, and you've lived decades beneath the waves. But this body's an air breather, and the constant pressure has been crushing you ever so subtly. Worse, your companion's mind seems to be wandering from the task at hand. He's a genius with machines, as you well know, but now he seems distracting. Okay, so I'm taking it that I'm in some shell of a body, been alive, dead before, something along those lines. The device in his hands is covered in knobs, wires, and antennas. He believes it can get, he believes it can get the two of you through the corroded door. But he's merely staring at it. Perhaps he's lost his faith in his invention. That is hardly your concern. This mission cannot be delayed. It must proceed. So, I think I will cast a spell. Okay? You mumble a few words, drawing power from the air around you until a solution appears in your mind. You snatch the device from his hands, rewire it, and shove it back in. Oh, he says. Examine your work. Sorry, I was trying to improve the thing. He waves the device at the door, and the stale air of your bubble freshens as the door swings open. The dark hallway lies beyond the passage that links the water board of the cells. Oh, excuse me, and the aquatic viewing areas. What you see lies there. Moments later, you're in the water again, your hands closing around a strangely familiar artifact. You need it to complete something. It hovers above a pedestal rotating in the dark water. An electric current runs through your fingers and your hands cross the vertical plane of the pedestal. The mirror doesn't feel coalesces so fast that the wave of pressure phases you for a moment. The rising pulse of a sonar alarm ripples through the air. 
the guards won't be far behind. Let's see. Use a device to stop them, one of the ciphers in your belt. So, you know, I've seen things like this before in some of like, the old Ultima games where it kind of gives you a tutorial and it's a character creator all in one. So what I'm wondering is if I'm actually creating my character through making these choices and somehow shaping the character that I'm going to be. I don't know yet. We'll see. Uh, you run urgent fingers over the devices fastened to your waist, a fog rising in your mind. A few can be used against the guards, but will also turn your skin to synth steel or the surrounding water to boiling wax. Hardly ideal. Finally, you find a small silver sphere. Setting the sphere in place, you kick desperately for a safety of the nearby outlet. The sphere whirls and unfolds into a spiraling vortex. The sphere at its center speaks a few polite words into an ancient tongue or ancient language, then begins draining the surrounding water into itself at an alarming speed. The approaching guards, sh the approaching guards shout, then scream as they too are sucked into the whirlpool and ripped to pieces. You allow yourself a fleeting smile, but are all too aware that more alarms are going off in the distance. The memory begins to fade as if you were being drawn backward through a tunnel, and you hear more pylons rising from the pit. Something is wrong. The events within the orb have settled into the gap in your mind, but the edges of it are rough, as though the memory itself is not truly yours. There's something else, a gust of sour air pulling at you, like a predator inhaling the scent of a prey at the far end of a dark, whispering field. There's pretty good writing in this. The light around the door's frame dims and flares like a roaring fire in the wind. Behind this enormous door, a door chill radiates from its bronze signal surface, and the thick metal wheel seems frozen into place. There's another orb. I suggest we touch it. You stand beside a woman on a furred crag. Beneath the two of you is a broad plateau towering above the overgrowth far below. Strange machines have been built into the cliffside, presumably for reconnaissance or defense. A metallic disc gleams from the center of the plateau. There's your self-aware humanoid machines drilling to the base of the cliffs below you. If you were looking for a sanctuary and you were desperate, desperately, this seems to be the right place. I don't know about, about this, the woman says her voice flat, neutral, her face is turned away from you. What makes this place any more secure than any of the other ones we've found? Draw her attention to the hidden detail. The more ex yeah. Because I'm a little bit more experienced than she is. You shade your eyes against the bright sun so that you can point out the thin bands radiating from the metallic disc. How the energy from those bands affects the local fauna, suggesting an enormous source of prior world energy. She thinks deeply. It's geologically sound. Have you run the sounding have you run the sounding samples and checked the strata? No major caverns or weaknesses showed up on your resonance scans. She waits for your affirmation and says, Alright, I'm convinced. The two of you sketch your plans for the sanctuary, drawing schematics and architectural diagrams. Then you descend into the plateau and examine the open ground. The woman suggests having one of the servitors build a shelter for your time here. You try to draw one of the constructs away from its task, but it doesn't respond to your voice. When you lay a hand on, on its shoulder to reinforce your command, it whirls and strikes you across the face with inhuman speed. It turns back to its task, ignoring you. Your companion helps you rise, laughter in her eyes. It seems your construct has other ideas. What's the matter with it? Oh, let's see. Let's force it. A mist falls onto the plateau as you activate, activate the time scarred artifacts fastened on your construct's behavioral core with a sub vocalized command. With an abrupt clack and the pulse of a pleasant of pleasant warmth, the device purge the air. The devices purge the air, and seven copper banded spears drop out of the evenly spaced rifts in the air. Ignoring this command, this common side effect. 
You give new orders to the malfunctioning construct in a firm, clear voice. Acknowledged. It immediately trundles to the site of your new shelter. The image freezes, then fades, and you feel the memory filling the gap in your mind, block by jagged block. You stagger, clutching your head, reclaiming your memory's hurts. And once more, there's something else. Hairs lift one by one on the back of your neck. Something beyond this room can sense what you're doing, and it's hunting you. Interesting. Okay. Time to go this way, I guess. Another memory. A vision of a city springs up around you, your city in flames and under attack. Her defenders have fought and died all day, and still the attackers keep coming. They fight as if your destruction were demanded of them. They care nothing for mercy, surrender, or plunder. What they want is blood. But you have bought, brought a keen-eyed companion to the top of the tower. She has seen the way to stop the invaders. You need to get, to get her to safety, and you need to rally your defenders. But even as you turn toward the door of the tower, two of the attackers descend from a hovering machine. You don't have time to strike at them before they land. One is brutishly large, his weapon a vibrating axe. The other is slim, sheathed in glassy armor and holding a hilt with a sizzling invisible blade. Your companion backs away. She's too young to help. Your enemies advance single file, confined by the parapet. Let's figure out who presents the greater threat. The memory seems crystal clear. The giant is menacing, it's true, but the invisible blade of his companion is more worrisome still. The energy field that flickers and waves around it suggests that she can carve matter at the molecular level, tearing pieces of her target into nothingness. If you're, if you're to save yourself, your best bet is to tackle her first. She's stuck behind the giant, awaiting her turn to attack you, unable to bring her weapon to bear until he's out of the way. But it's clear that she expects him to handle you, and her eyes rove behind you, her focus on your ward. She's certainly not expecting you to dive between the giant's legs and come up inside her guard. She can't bring her blade to bear in time, and you drive the dagger up under her chin. You catch her before her deadly blade drops onto you and spin her around. The weapon slashes into the giant and topples bisected. Nice. The immediate threat ended, you focus on finding a way back to your allies. You open the tower door and rush down the stairs. The door at the base of the stairs is slightly cracked, opening just a bit into the hall, and you hear more of the enemy soldiers beyond. Let's see if I can't sneak past them. You press yourself against the clinging door, easing it open, and your breath catches in your throat as it squeaks quietly. The sound the sound like a bell in your memory. You pause, but the soldiers in the hall continue to talk. You push again, squeeze yourself through the narrow opening, and creep down the blood-stained hall. Your memory begins fade, and you find yourself back in your own body. Your temples throb with the racing force of your heartbeat, and the reclaimed memories blaze within you, like a bonfire on a mountain peak, visible to every predator for kilometers around. A tremor rocks the floor beneath you, as though a massive fist has struck the room itself. Swaying, swaying on your feet, you see frantic movement within the borders of a mirror at the edge of the room. All right, well, let's go check that out then, shall we? There's a mirror. The board of the mirror is lavishly decorated with a dizzying number of interlocked symbols, daggers, masks, paintbrushes, amulets, and more. But that's nothing compared to what you see in the glass. You see a vast crowd of people, exact doppelgangers of you, shoving, arguing with, and fighting each other. Most are drab imitations of you, but a precious few are vivid and pull at your attention. Each of them bears an intricate pentagonal tattoo on their head. In their eyes, their actions, you see the memories you discovered within the orbs and the choices you made, shining like distant stars. Your hand twitches at your side, and though some of the bright doppelgangers ignore you, an even smaller number immediately turn to you, waiting for you to choose them and learn what you might become. A rumble shakes the room, 
and a slow vibration spread from the darkness below, rippling towards the ceiling. We'll point at the intelligent doppelganger. How's that? The doppelganger holds itself erect among the pressing crowd. It meets your eyes with a confident gaze, triggering familiar memories in the back of your mind. When you return for your contemplation, the doppelganger is waiting for your decision with the, the knowing smile. Yes, this is who I am. Yeah, this definitely sounds like a character creator to me. Oh, it, look, it looks like I just gained, yeah, gained intelligence, two intelligence there. The remaining doppelgangers, doppelgangers scatter for the edges of the mirror and vanish. Your chosen identity steps forward. It appears, its appearance changes as it steps out of the rippling glass. Its face exudes intelligence and confidence. Shadows of several device shimmers all around it, technology of several kind from a myriad of past ages. You get the feeling it, you, would be comfortable with all of it. The word nano sounds in your mind. The doppelganger continues walking, stepping into you, filling you, making you whole. Your decision, your decision rings out in the cavernous rooms, awakening and unlocking vast mechanisms behind the wall. Suddenly, a grotesque noise rings through your shared worlds like a bell if bells could rot. Something is coming. All right, so I gain all my health and everything back. The mirror fades, leaving a dark open doorway. You take a deep breath and step through Okay, so it says Intelligent Nano. So this looks like I just finished this and this is the beginnings of the character creator. So it's kind of a, an interesting way to put the character creator and the tutorial all together. It's kind of telling a story and it's setting up a character, but it looks like I can select whatever character I want. So it automatically said, uh, gave me the nano. The nanos are sometimes called mages, wizards. Okay, so here, there's three different classes. Glaze are warriors, um, scouts, guardian warlords, and soldiers, high might, heavy armor, and weapons. Okay, so this is uh, heavy armor weapons kind of guy, jack, jack of all trades. Jacks are best when they combine weapons, armor, esoteries, ciphers, and clever tongue. So these are, yeah, they're kind of like the jacks of all trade. And then nano. These are wizards, sorcerer, witches. This is generally the uh, the type of the type of class that I like to play anyhow. So I think uh, wizards, mages, some kind of spellcaster. I think I'll I'll go this route. All right. So next. So here are my pools. I've got two points left over here. Put them in here. I guess it looks good. types here. Okay, so I can have two. Okay. So quantum step teleport ally. Meh. Adaptation protected. Armor bonus. Meh. Okay. This this sounds interesting. Your surface thoughts of people, creatures you speak of. Okay, so the scan thoughts looks good to me. I know in a lot of these games uh, when you have the ability to have extra options and conversations it always is beneficial so I'm gonna take that remove all negative fettles excludes flanked and blah 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 heal six points out all right that sounds like a healing that's always good too so okay skills each skill starts at the novice level which is blank blank train can be one or specialized can be two descriptors often have some skills at the these two red inability level meaning they inflict penalties all right, so I've got penalties, heavy weapons, medium weapons, mesis, and the 
releases and releases. Never, never heard of that word, so <laughs> don't know. But I have, I am tra trained in it. Nice access memories of previous consciousnesses. The skill represents your focus and acumen when attempting to recall those experiences. All right, it seems like that's probably a good thing to have. Let's see, choose exploration skill machinery. All right, I'm gonna pick this because I'm guessing there's probably locked stuff, and this to me would make sense that this would be how you get past it. So, with the scan thoughts one and uh, the lore machinery, that should give me it's. I mean, traditionally, that would give me some extra options as far as, you know, the RPG elements go. So I'll pick those two. All right, nothing there. Now, these are descriptors. Okay. Oh, okay. So these are, you can further customize, but they have, they have some pluses and minuses here. Perception stealth minus initiative. Okay, so I'm getting pluses in these two things for, for an additional minus. Persuasion and deception, those are usually pretty good. But you know what I'm not liking about this is minus one on the intellect. Oh, I see what happened here too. So it changed from my intelligent nano to whatever this is. So here's intelligent. So plus two intellect, one training on this, and minus one concentration. So I had concentration before. So with concentration, bonded artifacts. Okay, I don't quite know what that is yet, but I'm guessing I'll figure that out. That sounds like something I'm gonna want, so let's not go with this. So this one is interesting. I get one intellect, one natural, one machinery. It pops my machinery up all the way. One healing, but I get minus persuasion and deception. Those are usually good options to have. gives me sight reuse intimidation yeah I think I'm gonna pick this because then I've got mystical lore and I've got sight reuse concentration yeah I'm gonna go this route going to read the rest of these. Um, I'll just kind of talk about it as I go. This whole place is basically your mind. Your body's still out there in the real world healing from that fall. You need to get out there and finish the process. All right, so I'm in my mind right now. And I got a bunch of questions I'm just going to kind of zip through. I like to uh, make sure that I ask all these questions because usually there's always something buried in it. You have to finish the process. After waking up the dream state and attuned to the tides, you'll need to find something called a resonance chamber. Your body should have landed somewhere near it. Just climb inside that and everything will be fine. Okay, sounds good. Easy peasy, right? You mean the tune. Tides are like a force, like gravity or magnetism or something, except they respond to people's actions and perceptions. Your body, that is, your body in the real world needs the tides to survive. It's not something you need to worry about. Your body will attune as it wakes up. So 
these are all just different parts of my mind. Then we get back to the real world. Well, that doesn't look good. God's it's sorrow. Okay, well, it's just pierced three guys. The sorrow is anchored to those reflections. It's devouring their power, okay? You have to get rid of them. Destroy its anchor or else the sorrow will erase us forever. Crisis initiated. Okay. Kill the reflections anchoring the sorrow. Crisis begins when we enter into a dangerous situation. Crises are turn-based encounters. We can fight, sneak, or manipulate. Okay, so this is what we were saying a little bit earlier. Is, um, getting through the quest is the important part. So, uh, however you do that is, is what's important. Killing a bunch of stuff along the way, it's not like, it doesn't seem like you get XP or anything, but it, it matters. Alright, the reflection in the killer. You'll loosen the sorrow and okay? That's that guy. Slice. 65, 85. So I'm only going to use two for right now. Basic attack. Give me 85. Okay, that seems to work. Sorrow's turn. Making some squeeze or something. I don't know. Now run. Get to the next one. You can sacrifice your action and do a double move instead. Attack. Okay. Sorrow's turn, he sends off another Squiddy. In my head, apparently. Alright, we need to get rid of this guy. So what's this? This is an esoteric. Plus five damage. Let's uh That's the transdimensional. I have no idea. When you put effort to an attack, it also increases the damage you deal. Different weapons and blades can be. Sounds 50, 90. So we're going to use 5, 1, 2, 3. Boom! Critical hit. Let's see if I can't move closer. Alright, that ends my turn. Sorrow infection. Affecting some Fettles are temporary conditions or status effects that can improve or reduce your character stats. The sorrow is just puts a fettle on your remaining reflection. But it's funny why they use some of these words and not, you know, an infection or you know, whatever. A curse or a word that, that we're familiar with. Fettles. Fetless, maybe. I don't know. I've never heard of the word. Maybe it's a word and I just don't know it. Alright, so we gotta get to this guy right here. Let's, uh. What's this? No, let's tag him with this. Let's do mental this time. Boom. There. Yeah, see, I just gained 40 XP. For completing it, not for each of the kills. They got nothing for each of the kills. You pried it loose, that thing is cancer and infection. It's unstoppable, unstoppable, but you stopped it. Alright, so we're going to get out of here. Alright, and now I need to pause this so I can go put my kids to bed. But then I'll be back.